You are watching DHTV from California State University to Mingus Hills. Welcome to California State University, Dominguez Hills, and the Distinguished Speaker Series with Dr. Cornell West. It's great to see so many people join us this afternoon. To begin with, we want to make sure that everyone here enjoys the event, okay? And so we have a program that is going to include uh, a video presentation, a special introduction, Okay, and then Dr. West's lecture. And so we ask that you please remain quiet and respectful to the extent you can. Of course, always acknowledge our, our speaker's points and, and give him the love that you're feeling. Okay, we honor freedom of speech and respect different points of view. However, disruption of our speakers during this program will not be allowed. We will allow you to ask questions uh, via submitted uh, postcards that will be passed to you in the audience after Dr. West's talk. So, everybody understand? All right, say, I got you, Samad. Say, don't start none. Won't be none. Okay, we good there. All right. You know, because everybody don't agree with everybody. And you're going to find out why in a minute. Malcolm X, or as your president would call him, Malcolm Tan, once said that I just don't believe that when people are being unjustly oppressed, that they should let someone else set the rules for them by which they can become free and come from under that oppression. Someone else cannot just set the rules for your equality and then tell you to play by those rules. Now we all know that this race game is a tough game out here. We selling, we're celebrating uh, 400 years of it from 1619 to now. And African Americans are not exclusive in this fight because the game has been waged against Native Americans it has been waged against Asian Americans. It has been waged against Latino and Mexican Americans, okay? And so the game is so cold that every time we learn the rules, they change the rules, okay? And we've seen every pitch that can be thrown in this game called race in America. We've seen the fastball. We've seen the curveball. We've seen the cutter ball, we've seen the slider, we've seen the gutter ball, we've seen the blooper ball. That's the pitch that Biden throws, the blooper pitch, okay? And no matter what pitch they throw, if we hold back on it, they still call it a strike. And then if we protest it, it's our fault. But there has been one person for the last two generations that have been unabashedly calling balls and strikes on our behalf in a way that no one else has been able to do. And so at this time, I'd like to ask you to turn your attention to the video screen. After a long weekend of protests in Ferguson, Missouri, police arrested more demonstrators this afternoon after a march to raise awareness about police shootings nationwide. Author and professor Cornell West was arrested along with religious leaders and other protesters. 
This is a systemic problem. This is just not Ferguson. This is no. L.A., this is New York, this is Chicago, this is Detroit, this is Miami. We've got to have some accountability of arbitrary police power against especially poor young people and disproportionately poor chocolate youth. Let the young folks speak. John Coltrane let Eric Dolphy play because the young folk were coming through. That's what's happening right now in America. See, I'm a blues man in the life of the mind. I'm a jazz man in the world of ideas. Therefore, for me, music is, is central. So when you're talking about poetry, for the most part, Plato is talking primarily about uh, uh, words, whereas I talk about notes, I talk about tone, I talk about temper, uh, uh, I talk about rhythms. See, for me, music is fundamental. Philosophy must go to school not only with the poets, philosophy needs to go to school with the musicians. I think in the life and in the art of Billie Holiday, we see the triumph of the human spirit as it struggles against adversity. And in many ways, that's a paradigm of the black condition in America since we first arrived. One man led one movement that broke the back of American apartheid. Martin Luther King Jr., who is now celebrated every January, oftentimes by those who not just were critical of him, had deep hostility toward him in the 1960s when his body was still moving in space and time. Oh, it's a historical moment. It's the longest social movement since Montgomery, and it's led by young people. It's indigenous, grassroots leadership. This is fundamental. It takes tremendous discipline, it takes a minute, tremendous courage to think for yourself, to examine yourself. The Socratic imperative of examining yourself requires courage. You know, William Butler Yeats used to say, it takes more courage to examine the dark corners of your own soul than it does for a soldier to fight on the battlefield. Courage to think critically. You can't talk. Courage is the enabling virtue for any philosopher, for any human being, I think, in the end. Courage to think, courage to love, courage to hope. Well, the hope is primarily uh, based on the small victories. Uh, the small victories in terms of the black love, black care, black joy that serves as the basis of loving others and allowing the possibilities of persons coming together to change and transform prevailing circumstances. The vicious legacy of white supremacy has been for so long a dogma in American history. We hit it hard in 1861, we hit it again in the 1960s, but for the most part, it's still one of those tacit assumptions and presuppositions we'd rather sidestep and hold at arm's length. He was the first African American to get a PhD in philosophy here at Princeton. To the dedicated and devoted faculty. He went on to write more than 20 books, receive more than 20 honorary degrees, teach at Harvard and Yale, hold posts at universities from Paris to Addis Ababa. His latest hip hop CD got him named MTV's Artist of the Week, and he's played a futuristic sage in two of the Matrix movies. He is one of this country's most controversial and gregarious academics. His name is Cornell West. And so, to bring up the Diamond Institute's distinguished speaker for fall 2019, I'd like to call up a very special person who I consider a friend, who now happens to be my boss, and I love it, and he's also the 11th president of Cal State University Dominguez Hills, Dr. Thomas Parham. Let me say good afternoon. Let me say good afternoon to the rest of you. Good afternoon. First of all, I want to bring you greetings on behalf of our senior administration, our faculty, our staff, and the California State University system generally, the largest system of public higher education in all of America, not part of it, in all of America, educating some 490,000 students in the 23 campuses of which this is one. That sounds like an applause line to me, right? So we're delighted to see you all. I'm delighted to see you. And before we go any further, I've challenged 
this campus to be a trendsetter, to make sure that California State University in Dominguez Hills is the institution where these issues become topics of critical discourse and analysis. And as we have tried to do that in our Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series, I'm delighted to see that the Merv Diamond African American Political and Economic Institute is leading the way in bringing not just transactional but transformative leaders and speakers into this place. And it is led really under the vision of Dr. Anthony Samad. Dr. Samad, please stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Dr. Anthony Samad. Give it up! Now I have the pleasure of introducing an individual who friend went out the window a long time ago because he really is family. He is family. I met our brother 23 years ago when I was the national president of the Association of Black Psychologists. And in that convention, I said I wanted to bring together the broader spectrum of intellectual and psychological thought. So when we gathered in Chicago that year with everybody from Jake Carruthers and Malefi Asante to Asa Hilya, Naeem Akbar, Wade Nobles, Minister Farrakhan, and our brother Cornel West, I remember delivering a message that night that talked about and introduced a concept we call Ore Iri. Ore Iri. It literally translated means one whose consciousness is aligned with one's destiny. And I introduced that again because one of my favorite memories, although this is kind of how the ego works, as I finished my presentation to an you know, arena full of people like this, the first person, the first, out in the middle of the aisle, bowing down, trying to give a brother some prompts, is our guest speaker right here. That's how we met. And I was honored that he would come and honor me as the president to be one of our keynote speakers for the convention, and he just threw down. And we have been friends ever since, have met his family, never met his late father, have met his dear mother, his brother, but know that he has a heart of gold and a voice that you need to hear. The prophetic voice of one of my heroes, Dr. Martin Luther King, reminds us all that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Somebody know what I'm talking about today. And our guest today does not remain silent about the most profound issues that impact people today, especially those whose lives, and the people whose lives, we call them everyday people. Uh, their lives are lived at the margins of society, those that portrait the scholar Derek Bell call the faces at the bottom of the well. In introductions, you may hear him describe himself much like you did on the video, as a blues man in the life of the mind, a jazz man in the world of ideas. And yet, beyond those characterizations of his identity, he's also a brilliant academician, scholar, teacher, as well as a celebrated public intellectual. But I want you to imagine a voice, ladies and gentlemen. Imagine a voice that is not locked away in the abyss of uncrystallized mental musings that reduce it down to useless chatter, a voice that is prepared to take flight amid right, the air of intellectual stimulation and not one that is tethered to an anchor of cautious reflection where sound is muted by that insatiable need to seek external validation and affirmation from those we believe should approve of the content and process dynamics of our speech. I know I'm talking to somebody this afternoon. See, somewhere I read that there ought to be something wrong, students, with 
an educational system that leaves our children strangers to themselves, aliens to their culture, oblivious to their condition, and unfulfilled in terms of their educational possibilities and potential. So we got to bring somebody heavyweight up in here, floats in a whole different stratosphere to rock the house. Well, our speaker comes to you today to reacquaint us with who we are at the core of our being. Our speaker comes to us today to remind us of the grand traditions from which our struggle for freedom and dignity emerge. Our freedom comes today to instigate a reality check on our condition as a people and as a nation. And our guest speaker comes today to immerse us in the waters of intellectual stimulation and dislodge us from those comfortable categories of intellectual, emotional, and behavioral apathy that have us believing that our condition in today's world is one of stasis and we just got to keep going along with it just because that's the way it always has to be. Uh-uh. It don't have to be like that. I brought somebody in the house to really speak plain and speak truth to you today. That's what he's doing here today. So whether... Whether we hear his voice in the 20 plus books or the zillion manuscripts that he's written, Hope on a Tightrope, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud, the Cornell West Reader, big thick book. Got lots of his essays in it. Democracy Matters or Race Matters, which contains, I was telling Dr. Nay, my favorite essay that he's written that's called Black Strivings in a Twilight Civilization. Now, I want to invite you, and I mentioned some of these works because we spend so much time worshiping personalities, and he's a very impressive personality. But it does no good if you only worship the personality and don't study and embrace the principles he looks to teach us. Right? His voice speaks with an uncompromising clarity about the things that do and should matter in our lives. Indeed, Dr. King reminds us that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. And he clearly is a drum major for justice, a drum major for peace, a drum major for righteousness, but also he's an individual I'm proud to call a friend and family to my wife, Davida, my daughter, Kenya and Tanya. He is, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most celebrated intellectual and the smartest man on the planet I know, Dr. Cornell West. Give it up! What a blessing, what a privilege, and what an honor to be here. California State University, Dominguez Hills, it's a new day, it's a new day. It's a new day, oh yes it is. I'm so blessed to be here, but you got a captain of the ship here, my dear brother Thomas A. Parham. He exemplifies the best of the same tradition that I come out of, which is the tradition of trying to tell the truth, trying to engage in a serious and a courageous struggle for justice with that magnificent sense of humor and the eloquence. He is the most visionary leader of an institution of higher learning in the country. You all know you're blessed to have him. Give it up for my dear brother. Give it up for Thomas A. Parham, Jr. Oh, yes. Give it up for our brother. Oh, indeed, indeed. And when you see him, you see Joseph White, his mentor. You see Aza Hilliard. You see Wade Nobles. A whole tradition that goes through him because each and one of us, we are who we are because somebody loved us. And tomorrow, my dear brother and his blessed wife, the First Lady, Davida, they will be celebrating their 34th anniversary in deep love. Both of them stand up. Both of you stand up. 34 years, deep love. 
Deep loyalty. Fidelity. We salute you. It's a beautiful thing. I salute the faculty. I salute the students. I salute each and every one of you who've been kind enough to take this kind of time on a Friday afternoon in Los Angeles, given the traffic that you got to come to terms with. Salute the board. And Brother Anthony, what can I say, my brother? It's been decade after decade. You ran the form. Now you're running the Domily Institute strong as ever. Give it up for my dear brother Anthony Samar. Salute you, brother. I want to be very candid with you today. It seems to me that we cannot talk about the grim moment in which we find ourselves unless we begin with a critical examination of ourselves. When the moment of unbelievable spiritual breakdown, an unbelievable imperial meltdown, and the question would be what kind of prophetic and progressive fight back will we be able to forge? So I begin on a personal note. The greatest honor I've ever had in my life has nothing to do with Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and University of Paris. It's being the second son of the late Clifton and the present Irene B. West. That I'll never, ever be the man my father was. And I wish you had a chance to meet him. Mom, still strong. I was just in Sacktown in Sacramento this week, and they had a magnificent honoring of her. Irene B. West Elementary School has been in place now for 16 years, but it was a recognition of her coming out of a tradition of Jim Crow, Louisiana, and made her way to the chocolate side of Sacramento called Glen Elder. And any time you see me or say something about me, try to see the mom and dad, the Irene and the Clifton in me because I am who I am because somebody loved me. And I've got to wrestle with what's inside of me to get me fortified to come to terms with this grim moment in which we find ourselves. And for me, it's inseparable. The West family is inseparable from Shiloh Baptist Church, Reverend Willie P. Cook, Deacon Hinton, and Sarah Ray, my vacation Bible school teacher who shaped and molded a little gangster called Cornell West, and I came up, still, came up still swinging. And the reason why I call so many folk gangster when I think they're gangsters like our president is not because I'm demean, demeaning him or demonizing him, but rather I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivity. <laughs> so I'm talking about something inside of me. Something I'm wrestling with every day, trying to reconquer week after week after week. Critical self-inventory, the great Antonio Gramsci called it. And, of course, that line 38A of Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living. Do we have the courage to examine who we are, to locate and situate ourselves in a story, in a tradition, in a family, in a church, a mosque, a, a, a synagogue? It could be relations and Apprenticeship in music, apprenticeship in athletics. What are the sources of good in our own existence, in our short move from mama's womb to tomb? That's the question. And that sits at the very center of what education is all about. And by education, I mean what the Greeks call paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A. -E paideia is Deep education, not cheap schooling. And what I love about this institution is that cheap schooling is information and skill acquisition, and it's over. I can't wait to get my degree so I can live large in some vanilla suburb and feel so good about myself and become well-adjusted to injustice. Successful. I wasn't raised in a tradition to be successful in terms of the criteria of the world. It was to be great. And somewhere I read, he or she is greatest among you will be your servant. What quality of service will you render? Will you focus on the least of these, on those in prison, 
those in the hood, those wrestling with decrepit school systems, inadequate housing, wrestling with mass underemployment and unemployment. Why? Because it's a joy to tell the truth and a joy to be in struggle against the forces that are losing sight of the least of these. That's my tradition. And there's a whole lot of other voices. I just happen to be a revolutionary Christian. That's a Jesus-loving free black man, but I know I have no monopoly on how one understands the world. I got some Muslim brothers and sisters who I can't live without. I would have snapped a long time ago without Malcolm X. I got Buddhist sisters like Bell Hooks. I would have snapped a long time ago without Bell Hooks. Give it up for Bell Hooks. I got agnostic brothers like James Baldwin, who I can't live without. And he's a gay brother, too. A lesbian sister, Audrey Lord. I'm talking about their humanity, their honesty, their decency, their truth-telling, their justice-seeking, trying to keep track of something bigger than them so that they can be giving and donating of themselves. And let us be honest about it. My dear brother talked about 16, 19, 400 years, that we black people, for 400 years, have been so chronically and systemically hated not just held in contempt, hated. And yet we didn't talk to the world so much about how to love. Oh, yes, I could just turn on John Coltrane's Love Supreme and sit down. Just let every note, every silence between the notes saturate your soul. He was born 93 years ago on Monday in Hamlet, North Carolina, grew up in High Point. The music is still being heard 93 years after that genius was born in Jim Crow, North Carolina. But he's one voice among others. I could talk about Stevie Wonder, love and the need of love. I could talk about Mark and Marvin Gaye's, what's going on, love shot through every note and, and silence between the note in that album. I could present to you Mama. In Raising in the Sun by a genius from the south side of Chicago named Lorraine Hansberry in her 20s. There's never been so much love in one figure on the American stage than in Mama in a Raising in the Sun. And we haven't even got to Toni Morrison's beloved yet. We could go on and on. What is it about these people? These enslaved, Jim Crow, Jane Crow, hated people who have such bounce back and teach the world so much about love. Martin Luther King Jr., love warrior. Fannie Lou Hamer, love warrior. Ella Baker, love warrior. I can introduce to you my Aunt Payne. She was a love warrior too. We have to situate ourselves in such a way that we have access to what has gone into us at our best. And black folk have no monopoly on this. Our indigenous brothers and sisters whose land was stolen, whose bodies were violated, they have rich traditions. Our Latino brothers and sisters in this state of California that used to be Mexico, let us never forget that. Now, how come it's no longer Mexico? Imperial war, violent, coercive, forceful, fraudulent war. That's in the language of Ulysses S. Grant, who was in the war, who became president and was a major general in the Civil War. We have to be candid about our past, but not romantic about it, because there's something bad about it, something good about it. Like any tradition, you have to recover elements of that tradition, but sometimes you have to recover from that tradition. It can suffocate you. It's too narrow. It's too truncated. You need education. You need paideia. You need to cultivate critical consciousness. I talk about it in my class for the last 44 years now. I've been teaching it the blessing, actually, to make it that long. In fact, my soul looks back and wonders, brother. How I got over. How I got over. Y'all remember that song Mahalia Jackson sang on the March on Washington? 
You remember that song that the greatest vocalist in the 20th century in popular music named Aretha Franklin sang on Amazing Grace right here in Los Angeles in 1972 with another genius playing the piano named James Cleveland sang the same song. And Claire Ward right there on the front row. She wrote that when she was 27 years old. She wrote that when she was in Jim Crow, Atlanta, when the Ku Klux Klan had surrounded her Cadillac with her mother Gertrude and her sister Willa, and they wouldn't act as if they're going to knock the car over and Gertrude, the mother, act like she was speaking in tongues and it scared the Klan. They ran away. They made it to the hotel and Clara Ward put that song down on paper. How I got over. And that song becomes a song for each and every one of us as human beings because all of us are wrestling with what it means to emerge out of our mama's wombs and know that one day we will be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. I hate to remind you all that on a Friday afternoon, but the issues of death, not just physical death, but social death of slavery, civic death of Jim Crow and Jane Crow, the psychic death of giving up on yourself and no longer believing you have the self-respect and self-confidence to be able to achieve what you imagine you can achieve. And then the spiritual death where you either just sell your soul for a mess of pottage and just want to fit into some hierarchy in place so that you can feel good about yourself and end up selling your soul for a mess of pottage. The tradition that I come from, and I'm just a little small part of it, see, tries to mobilize those spiritual, moral, political, economic, and social resources so I can learn how to straighten my back up and take a stand. In fact, there was a brother in my church every fifth Sunday in Shiloh who used to play on the organ. We call him Sylvester, but he's known to the world for the genius that he is. That he is. His name is Sly Stone. He wrote a song called Stand, You've Been Sitting Much Too Long. There's a permanent crease in your right and wrong. Y'all remember that song? Stand, there's a midget standing tall and the giant beside him about to fall. Stand, there's a cross for you to bear things to go through if you going anywhere. Brother Martin Luther King used to say, straighten your back up. Because anytime everyday people straighten their backs up, they're going somewhere because folk can't ride your back unless it's bent. What happens? When those James Cleveland call ordinary people begin criticizing themselves and others, unleashing possibilities and powers such that they take a stand, they straighten their backs up, and they engage in a truth-telling. That's why I tell my students, and I want to say to all of the precious and priceless students of all colors here at this grand institution, that when you enter this institution, you are giving the professors license to allow you to learn how to die so you can learn how to live well. Learn how to die so that you learn how to live well. Plato himself says philosophy, love of wisdom, is a preparation and meditation on forms of death. To philosophize is to learn how to die, the great Montaigne says in the 16th century as a French thinker. Seneca says, he or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. Now, my dear brother, powerful scholar that he is as well as leader, talked about conceptual incarceration today what it means to have your mind in bondage. I've been blessed to teach in prisons now for 37 years. I was just at Norfolk a few weeks ago when Malcolm X was incarcerated. He turned that cell into a library and became one of the greatest fearless freedom fighters of the 20th century, educated in jail, which means what? Even those who don't go to college still recognize that a college can go through them. That's Malcolm. That's Malcolm. But he learned how to die. Now, what is learning how to die? What does it have to do with racism? 
Well, of course, one is that white supremacy itself needs to die in order for America to live, in order for the world to live. But what are the ways in which white supremacy can begin to die? It begins with us, and it begins with each one of us. I don't care what color. There's a whole lot of white supremacy in the souls of black people. Just take a look. You don't have to have vanilla brothers and sisters running around to keep track of white supremacy. Because white supremacy says what? Not just black love is a crime, not just black hope is a joke, not just black freedom is a curse, but it says you're just less beautiful, you're less intelligent, you're less moral, and most importantly, you ought to go around feeling intimidated and scared and fearful and deferring to folk who themselves exemplify white supremacist authority. We call it niggerization. That's what it is to niggerize the people, to invest in with white supremacy so deeply in every nook and cranny of their dreams and their wake life that you don't have to worry about them straightening their backs up. You don't have to worry about them being critical. You don't have to worry about them organizing and mobilizing. You don't have to worry about them presenting a challenge. You don't have to worry about them constituting any kind of threat to a white supremacist status quo. They have already consented to their own oppression by accepting the white supremacist lies about themselves. I thank God that I went to a church where some of our sermons was, Jesus de-niggerizes black people. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what our Muslim brothers used to say in the 60s. Right. You want dignity. You want to be de-niggerized, follow Allah. That's prophetic Islam. Some of our Jewish brothers and sisters, follow Amos, follow Esther, Follow Isaiah. Some of my secular comrades who can't stand religion, believe religion in its dominant form is always a form of pacifying folk. They say, follow the freedom train and a critique of capitalism and imperialism, but make sure you focus on the wretched of the earth. Straighten your back up. Learn how to die by critically examining yourself and then opening yourself to be of use and of service to somebody else catching hell. Oh, what a great tradition. What a great tradition. But it's not just a matter of politics and economics and socioeconomic status. I believe in the primacy of the moral and the spiritual as it connects to an analysis of the operations of power that begins with empire. The United States was an empire before it was a country. It was a corporation before it was a country. They, they came here as an extension of European empires for gold and resources. That's why they mistreated our precious indigenous brothers and sisters. That's why I can't stand that neoliberal chatter on corporate media TV. Oh, yeah. Don't fall for the hype. American slavery was America's original sin. That's a lie. That was the second one. And we black folk, we don't have to ignore somebody else's suffering to be concerned about our own suffering. We start on the chocolate side of town with our own suffering and allow our love and solidarity to spill over so that we concern about what's happening with our precious Mexican brothers and sisters given this vicious treatment on the border. We concern about what's going on in Yemen and Afghanistan and Pakistan when those U.S. drones are dropped. We concern about our Jewish brothers and sisters in France when they're being discriminated. We concern about our Palestinian brothers and sisters when they are the Israeli occupation. It's a moral issue. It's a spiritual issue. Don't tell me what your identity is until you tell me what is the moral content of your identity. What are the political consequences of it? What kind of risk are you willing to take? What kind of courage are you willing to exercise? That's the tradition that we're talking about. And let us be honest. We have to start with ourselves. Because so many of us, sometimes in our lives, have been unwoke. I spent a whole lot of time, Brother Anthony, with folk who were woke. And I say I appreciate it, but you're going to suffer from insomnia unless you don't get some sleep sometime. 
You better pace yourself. You don't need to be a sprinter in the struggle for justice and freedom. You need to be a marathon runner. It's got to be a way of life, not a contemporary lifestyle. It's got to be not just a brand. It's got to be a cause. And I want to say this to the young folk because you live in such a market-driven culture, obsessed with celebrity, obsessed with spectacle and image and what appears to be the case. Don't let anybody tell you that the primary issue in your life is learning how to brand yourself in order to make it on the market. Don't let anybody tell you that. You tell them, I got a cause. I got something I'm willing to fight for. I got something I'm willing to die for. And if I've got to use some market strategy at times, it's subordinate to my cause. Don't let nobody tell you that your career is more important than your calling. Don't let anybody tell you that your profession is more important than your vocation. Or that your job is more important than your life task. What are you here for? What they going to say at your funeral when your body's in the coffin? They're not going to talk about your brand. They're not going to talk about what's on your curriculum vitae. They're not even going to talk about how many books you wrote. They want to know, was that person in any way great? And greatness will define in terms of what was the quality of love they expressed? What kind of compassion were they willing to forge? What did they sacrifice for? What made them smile? Yeah. What brought them real joy? And I'm by joy, I'm not talking about pleasure. So much of American culture is a joyless quest for insatiable pleasure. You can get all the pleasures you want, all the bodily titillation and stimulation you want, and when it's over, you still feel empty because you don't have a joy on the inside. Education at its deepest level means you find joy when you go to that laboratory and engage in scientific curiosity and investigation. You find joy when you read that Shakespeare and that Dante, that Tony Morrison or that Mario Rukeyser or Pablo Neruda. Why? Because you know it is both empowering and you will be able to empower others to the degree to which you cultivate your own gifts. And this is nothing but just the old wisdom of the old folk. It's true. What's the anthem of black people in America? Lift every voice. Written 28 years old, genius named James Weldon Johnson. From gut bucket Jim Crow, Florida with his brother, Rosamond Johnson, lift every voice. It doesn't say lift every echo. And we live in a culture of echo chambers. You hear somebody speak, it's just an echo of somebody else. That's much of television, too. Not too many voices on TV, just a whole lot of echoes, talking points. Go to Fox News, right-wing reactionary ideology, Go to MSNBC, milk toast neoliberal ideology. Go to CNN, it's a mix. Brother Anderson Cooper's kind to me and let me raise my voice, but right after, it's not a whole lot of voices left. Because it's so narrow, it's so truncated. America specializes in reducing the catastrophic to the problematic. As if catastrophe is just another problem to solve technically with managerial leadership. There's never been a Negro or black problem in America. There have been catastrophes visited on black people. That's not the same thing. There's never been a woman's problem in America. There's been catastrophes visited on women. There's never been an indigenous people's problem in America. There's been catastrophes visited on indigenous peoples. And when you start with catastrophe, it means you have a broader lens of analysis. You're not looking at an isolated problem to solve and keep moving. You're looking at the effects of catastrophe over time and wondering how do you enable and empower yourself spiritually, morally, intellectually to be part of a tradition to fight it and then pass it on to the younger generation. And at the very, very personal level. Oh, we got so much to learn. 
from black folk in this country. Terrorized for 400 years, but teach the world so much about tenderness. And the younger generation needs to hear this. Justice is what love looks like in public. Tenderness is what love feels like in private. And I come from a people who at our best was a tender people. A genius from Georgia named Otis Redden sang a song called Try a Little Tenderness. Another genius from Indianapolis named Babyface wrote a song for a quasi genius from Boston named Bobby, Bobby Brown called Tender Roni. <laughs> tender Roni. She ain't just Roni. What is it about being so tender? James Baldwin said when he met Malcolm X, Malcolm X was the most gentle and tender person he ever met. Now think of that image versus the image of Malcolm X in the vis a vis the white majority. From the white normative gaze, Malcolm X was full of righteous indignation and morally driven rage concerned about black people catching hell. But anybody who met him, one on one, tender man, gentle man, listen to the voice of a David Ruffin of the Temptations and keep track of the delicacy and the tenderness. A Nat King Cole, a Johnny Hartman, a Ella Fitzgerald, a Billie Holiday, a Sarah Vaughan, a Phyllis Hyman. We could go on and on and on and on and on. Keep track of that tenderness. We're losing that in wrestling with the spiritual collapse of integrity, honesty, dignity, tenderness. The blues itself is a sad but sweet indictment of misery. That's how Lorraine Hansberry defined it. It's sad, but it's sweet. B.B. King can sing the blues. Nobody loves me but my mama and she might be driving too. But there's a tenderness in the way he's stroking Lucille on his guitar. There's a tradition that's coming through his voice and the music of Robert Johnson and Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith. It's a tradition that recognizes that even on the visceral level, each and every one of us need a tenderness and a sweetness and a kindness tied to a toughness as we wrestle with capitalism, imperialism, wrestling with white supremacy, male supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, any ideology that loses is a sight of a Muslim or a Jew or a Mexican or a Filipino or a Korean or an Ethiopian across the board. And it's no accident that in moments when it looks as if America is sliding down the slippery slope to crypto fascist chaos, and that's where we're headed now. Let us be very clear, it is not just a matter of one president. We must never fetishize presidents. Presidents express social forces behind them. That Trump is a sign and a symptom of something deep in American history that's been there for 400 years. People think, well, oh my God, if we did away with Donald Trump and went back to business as normal, we would be all right. Get off the crack pipe. <laughs> it's true. And I got to say this to my black brothers and sisters who I love deeply. And y'all know I don't love black people in order for black people to love me back. I love black folk because black folk are worthy of being loved and told the truth. Oh, let's just go back to the Obama years. Things were so wonderful. What world are you living in? Wealth inequality. 1% of the population owns 42% of the wealth. Mass incarceration. The new Jim Crow. Drones being dropped 
not just on combatants, but civilians all around the Muslim world. Seven wars taking place, 25,000 bombs dropped every year. The black brother was in the White House. And if we can't raise our voices with a moral indignation and a spiritual integrity about the lives of people all around the world, then how can anybody expect that our concern for just black folk is a genuine one rather than just selfish? Oh, that's a challenge, I'm telling you. It's a major challenge. Why so? Because no one of us as a group can deal with what is coming at us. We must have solidarity. We must have a unity based on principle, integrity, a concern for the least of these. And if we don't have it, all the rest of it is sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. It's empty. It's vacuous. will never last. You've got to have integrity in this process. You've got to have truth tellers with integrity in persons who have the ability to speak. It is no accident that those persons who have been willing to live and learn how to die in order to live, to critically examine themselves and let go of certain prejudices, let go of certain assumptions, that's death. And there is no rebirth without death. You can never be reborn at the level of high education. You can never undergo maturation and learn how to mature. You can never develop without that form of death. The great Dorothy Day, our Catholic vanilla sister, one of the great prophetic figures of the 20th century, her eulogy for Martin Luther King was, Martin Luther King Jr. learned how to die daily. Boom, dropped the pen and left. And in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, what does Paul say? I die daily because there's a set of assumptions and presuppositions inside of me that's got to go. James Brown said, give it up, turn it loose. Bootsy on the bass. Clyde Stepperfield on the drums with the drummer song. Give it up, turn it loose. Give up certain dogma. Give up certain presuppositions. Give up certain prejudices. Give up certain Elements you don't want to criticize, you don't want to contest, so that you no longer grow. And one of the biggest problems of the United States is what? It has grown old, grown wealthy at the top, it has grown powerful, it has yet to grow up. It has not grown up. It's got a Peter Pan sensibility. And what was distinctive about Peter Pan? Not just that he was, didn't grow up, he's scared to grow up. But thank God we got magnificent young leaders like Brother Kristen Jackson. Stand up, brother, brother. Stand up. This is student by the president right here. Student by the president right here. Student by the president. As leader, young leader, visionary leader, learning from the other president. How do you learn how to grow up? Frankie Beverly says it's joy and pain, all right? It's a process of joy and pain. It's not just pleasure on the surface. It's that deep joy, that enduring joy, the thing that allows you to sustain yourself all the way through your life. And that's part of the moral and spiritual crisis. One of the saddest features of America past and present. It's so often spokespersons, leaders on the local level, state level, regional level, national level, when we raise our voices, we often get trashed. Character assassination, literal assassination. One of the reasons why I spend so much time in prison is because so often the brothers in prison were themselves warriors but couldn't find the right moral venue to fight. So you ended up fighting each other. And who's left? Largely folk who want to be polished professionals rather than love warriors. Polished professionals rather than justice warriors. You have to have a martial spirit. That's what I love about my dear brother Barham. You have to have a martial spirit. You've got to learn how to fight. 
But you, but you also got to learn how to love. I remember the song by that genius from New Orleans named Lil Wayne. And he wrote a song called, How to Love. Nobody taught me how to love. He's like Hamlet. Nobody taught Hamlet how to love. That's serious business. Dostoevsky says in the Brothers Karamazov, hell is those who suffer from the incapacity to love. That's what it is. And we live in a market culture that is afraid of deep love of truth and love of goodness. And love of the holy. There once was a time when we could go to our churches and get some truth. But now our pastors have become CEOs. You don't get truth from CEOs. You get market strategy. Our choirs have become praise teams. They want to titillate and stimulate. I want to get nourished. I didn't come to get titillated. I got titillated in the club on Friday night. I come to church. I want some care and nourishment. The same is true in Judaism. Same is true in Buddhism. I tell my precious Muslim brothers and sisters, don't let America eat you up and turn you into a market Islam. If Allah is great, that means there's no other gods, including the gods of materialism and hedonism and narcissism and narrow conceptions of success. You got to be true to something deeper than that. In my secular brothers and sisters, oh, we've got wonderful secular brothers and sisters who try to get deeper than careerism, deeper than opportunism, deeper than professionalism, using those simply as weapons to try to get folk to learn how to die in order to learn how to live. It is a human affair, but we are failing at the moment, and so our voices, not our echoes, our voices are needed. To be honest, to be fearful, to be bold, not to be intimidated, not to be scared. And it's difficult these days for folk to really be as soulful as a Donny Hathaway, as a spokesperson, and as a leader. Because what was it about Donny that he learned from Brother Scott on the chocolate side of St. Louis? He said, Donnie, if it's not coming from the depths of your soul, if you're not emptying everything out of you so that when you leave the performance, folk can tell that you can hardly breathe because you've given them your all, then you're not being true to the tradition. That's what James Brown would go for four hours in a concert, come out, could hardly breathe but would always say, and I'm an extension of you, you're an extension of me, I don't exist without you. Then anybody come here to hear a song that we did not play, and a sister in the back would holler, you didn't play soul power. He say, hit it, Bootsy, right on the side. That service, that service, you're there to serve. You are not there as spectacle. I went to a concert a couple of years ago and saw one of the young brothers and sisters come in flipping like they in the circus or something. They pick up the microphone, sing a song, Negro. I didn't come for spectacle. And he could sing. His name was Usher. I loved the brother, but he flipped too long. He flipped too long. I didn't come for all this flipping. But it's spectacle. And you end up with a whole generation of black middle class folk walking around like they peacocks. Look at me, look at me, I'm so successful, I'm so rich, I'm so smart, and I could hear my grandmother saying, peacock strut because they can't fly. <laughs> Don't show me your foliage, I wanna see your fruit. By your fruits you shall know them. By your deeds you shall know them. By your acts you shall know them, not what you're projecting. I say the same thing about my dear brother Jay-Z, who was a genius. I love that brother to death. But don't pose and posture in the NFL context. Tell us the truth about what's going on. Tell us the truth about you told the truth about Brooklyn. We want to know. Don't become a peacock. Be an eagle. 
An eagle is connected to deep education. An eagle is connected to Socratic questioning. A D eagle is connected to style, nobility, moral royalty. An eagle has what we need, which is the unbelievable determination to keep moving, to keep on pushing the way Curtis Mayfield put it. So where are we now? Let us be honest. Every one dollar spent in the U.S. Congress for the budget, 61 cents goes to the military industrial complex. So you only got 49 cents to work with right there. Both political parties voted for Trump's $750 billion increase in military. So even when the Democrats act like they so big and bad, you got a whole lot of peacocks in that party. Walking around acting like they so big and bad, but when it comes to being tested, how many are talking about poverty? Oh, there's a few. Thank God for Brother Bernie. Thank God for AOC. Thank God for Ayana. Thank God for Rashid. Oh, there's a few. Not a whole lot. And it's not a question of skin color. Because you got some black elected officials who are too well, in, well adjusted to injustice, too. And you got to keep them accountable. You got to protect them against white supremacist attack, but you got to keep them accountable in terms of their relation to poor and working people, their relation to the best of the trade union movement, their relation to the best of the feminist movement, their relation to the best of the anti homophobic, anti trans movement, and their relation to the best of our struggle of our precious immigrants here on the borders. But, but it's a challenge. W E B. Du Bois, the greatest public intellectual in the history of the American experience. He, like Martin Luther King Jr. said, you must begin with empire, you must begin with the class formations in predatory capitalist forces and connect it to ways in which white supremacy and male supremacy are shaped and are shaping those forces. Too often when we talk about race and racism, we reduce it to individual prejudice and personal sentiment. And overlooks structure, overlooks institution, and overlooks history. History. The U.S. Constitution, precious in many ways in terms of its formulation, but a pro-slavery constitution in practice for almost 90 years. How could that be? This is the very constitution that we elevate. But no reference to the institution of slavery in the U.S. Constitution. That's called denial. That's not, that's not just a subtle tension between principle and practice. That is a massive denial that doesn't want to come to terms with the 22% of the inhabitants of the 13 colonies who were enslaved Africans whose labor produced the wealth that was the precondition for American democracy. So the question becomes, how do we keep track of what has been denied over and over and over again? 244 years of slavery, 12 years of a multiracial democracy with Reconstruction, and then another 100 years of neo-slavery, pure and simple, and that's not segregation. Segregation is the deodorized term for your textbook. It ain't got nothing to do with the realities of black people between 1895 and 1963 when there was a black person who was lynched twice every week for over 50 years, the strange fruit that southern trees bear that the great Billy Holiday sang about with such power and the Jewish brother Maripole writing the lyrics. That kind of lynching, that's terrorism, that's American terrorism that Ida B. Wells Barnett tried to keep track of. So don't deodorize people's suffering. You got to keep it funky, keep it real. And that's the backdrop 
of what happens in 1965 when the vast majority of black people finally get a chance to vote and we see what kind of multiracial democracy we have and who is the first president elected after that, Richard Milhouse Nixon. That's the dominant response electorally to the social movements of the 60s. And from Nixon to Trump, with interludes of neoliberal milquetoast Democrats, Jimmy Carter, fiscal conservatism, deregulating already, Bill Clinton, eliminates government responsibility for poor people called the welfare reform bill, a bill that the Republicans had already put forward 12 years earlier, but he does it with a smile and plays a little saxophone. You know, our dear brother Barack Obama, a magnificent symbolic indictment of white supremacy at the highest level. But immediately tells Wall Street, I stand between you and the pitchforks, but I stand with you. I will protect you. You have nothing to worry about. And how many Wall Street criminals went to jail and engaged in insider trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activity, predatory lending? How many of them went to jail? Not one. But let Jamal and Letitia get caught with a crack bag on the corner. Oh, yeah. Let's just be honest about it. This is not about hate. Well, I, let me put it this way, because I'm a Christian. I, mean, I believe in loving everybody, but when you love everybody, that also means you love your enemies. And when you love your enemies, that means what? You have charitable Christian hatred. I hate to sin, and I try to love the sinner. And oppression is a sin. Exploitation is a sin. Hatred is a sin. Envy is a sin. You got to keep track of the realities. You can still stay in contact with the folk who are perpetuating it. They're made in the image of God. Yes, they can change. Yes, but most importantly, it means you don't add more hatred to the world. Your hatred is directed to the forces, the institutions, the realities to be changed. So you don't end up demonizing anybody. You don't end up viewing anybody as a devil. You keep track of their devilish behavior. Because you got some devilish behavior yourself. You see. That's the primacy of the moral and the spiritual in such a moment. And there's no accident that we're in a moment of such vast polarization around the vicious legacy of white supremacy, but also wealth inequality, also imperial privilege. We don't like to talk about that. They dropped that, bone, that, 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 that drone on the American brother Warren. And the White House had an immediate, quick press conference. And said, well, we had said that we hadn't killed any innocent people whatsoever. We just discovered we, just, we killed an American. And we are going to have economic compensation for that American for the rest of their lives. We're going to take care of their family for the rest of their lives. And yes, it is true that some of our drones do kill innocent folk. That's imperial privilege because for those precious brothers and sisters in Yemen and Libya and Somalia and Afghanistan and Pakistan when their innocent folk are killed there's not a mumbling word in the press there's no compensation there's no focus on their humanity they just collateral damage that's spiritually empty and morally obscene and what do we do no one of us can do it alone. No one group can do it alone. We have to engage in the highest forms of education, which is the formation of attention. We need to learn how to attend to the things that really matter. Not the superficial surface things, the things that really matter. Life, death, honesty, integrity, generosity, sacrifice of something bigger than you. We need to cultivate that critical orientation, and we need to engage in ascension, to use John Coltrane's language, to ascend to a level of hypersensitive concern to others. What is so magnificent about this institution, among many, many other things, is you bring so many magnificent students together with unbelievable talent and genius who oftentimes are overlooked. They like raw 
nuggets just can't wait to be shaped and molded and refined. So when they leave California State University, Dominguez Hills, they at their best are fortified. They're ready to be forces for good, forces for truth, forces for holy, for the religious ones. Thank God for the best of this institution. But every institution needs to do that. And the only way we begin to hit impending ecological catastrophe where the whole globe can go under, nuclear catastrophe, just a matter of a button. And that brother in the White House right now, it's not always clear he's got both paddles in the water anyway, <laughs> let alone too much hatred in his heart and contempt in his soul. We don't know what he'll do with that button. The economic catastrophe of the wealth inequality and its consequences. The moral catastrophe of the callousness and indifference to the suffering of the vulnerable. The great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say, indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. It's a whole way of life where you turn your back on other folk catching hell. And then the spiritual catastrophe where we just give up, cave in, or just fit in. And it's always an open question whether we have what it takes. We just don't know. The future's open-ended. History's always incomplete. It depends on what you do. It depends on what I do. And I just hope this wonderful, wonderful time I've had here, though, brother, I remember this the rest of my life, spending all this time with you all. You see, that we make a covenant with each other. That we're going to go down swinging like Ella Fitzgerald Muhammad Ali. We're going to swing with love of truth. We're going to swing with love of goodness. We're going to swing with love of beauty. And some of us are going to swing with love of holy. And then we'll see what we pass on to the precious generation and led in part by our dear brother, Kristen. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, sir. We got, we, we got good time for questions all <laughs> the We told you. So now this is the uh, opportunity for you to talk, meaning ask a question. You know, we've heard our, I have a dream, huh, Dr. West? We don't need to hear it again, but Dr. West has been so kind. So if your hand is up, a postcard will be bought to you. You got to put your question on that postcard, and then they will bring it up here, and we will answer, ask your question, and Dr. West will answer it. As John Wooden used to say, be quick, but don't hurry. <laughs> so do we have our first questions? You got your, is your question ready? Okay, bring it on up. They have a microphone. Oh, they'll bring it up here. Yeah, they'll bring it up yeah, here. Okay, okay. That's how we ask the folks. Oh, yeah, I got some. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Dr. West, I am a Skid Row resident. When are you coming to us? Oh, where should I go? Oh, downtown L.A. Oh, oh no, I, 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 well, I know my, my dear brother Mark Ridley Thomas and others have been telling me about that fighting this homeless thing. No, indeed. But you came all the way from downtown L.A. with all the traffic and everything? 
Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. I, I'm going to get to Skid Row now. I'm going to get to Skid Row. I'm supposed to get back. Definitely. But just know that I embrace you. And every word when I talk about being fortified, keep your spirit strong and know that there's folk who are not just concerned, but who are trying to make sure we eliminate the conditions of homelessness. In the yeah, I'm going to say that aloud. Precious black middle-aged women. Number one. Decade after decade, absolutely, my dear sister. And your name is, my sister? Yeah, give it up, give it up for us. Thank you so much. But I, I, I do want to get this kid right. I appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Seems like uh, there's some other folk that want you to come see them, too. The reggae community celebrates Marcus Garvey, but feel Dr. Du Bois was a problem. Is that a statement or a question? Did you ask that one too? Oh, you got some questions, my dear sister. That's wonderful. Yes. That's right. Well, I love both of them. I learned much from both of them. Marcus Garvey's love for black people is beyond description. I always say Marcus Garvey used to get up with black folk on his mind at 6 a.m. Du Bois would wait until 8.30 and listen to a little Wagner before he, before he shifted. Uh, but by the time 9 o'clock came, they both had a deep love. But we as a people and have a tradition are like a jazz orchestra. When we raise our voices, we don't have unanimity. We have differences, we wrestle with our differences, but we still have a hatred of white supremacy. We have a hatred of any form of oppression, and we ought to be critical because something stands bigger than all of us, which is truth, which is truth. And so we learn from one another. Absolutely. So no Marcus Garvey, is someone. we were just talking about Marcus Garvey, yo, with, with President Barham. Absolutely. And Du Bois, Du Bois has no monopoly on truth either. Du Bois couldn't, couldn't understand blues. He didn't understand jazz. And, George Clinton would have gave him a heart attack. But we love Du Bois. He was an old school Victorian brother. Everybody's a child of their age. So you got it right there. You know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. All right, Dr. West. So we'll ask that we, we, we won't work you so hard. No, that we, you can, we, I'm, I'm here to work. We, I'm here to work. That you ask the question and then give the answer. We'll ask oh, the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is your opinion? Uh, to the challenge of so-called gang violence and the culture that it influences. Well, as I said before, though, we got the precious young brothers who oftentimes don't see the kind of high education at work in their schools. So they don't see education as enabling, as empowering. And they're deeply influenced by the dominant images in the market on TV and film, which is primarily guns, 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 male domination, manipulation of women as if they're just object for sexual pleasure. And this is not a racial thing. This is a global and a national phenomena. You see. So we got to stay in contact with the humanity of these young brothers and let them know there is another way. That's one reason why I spend so much time in the studio with the young brothers and sisters, to let them know that they come from a musical tradition that's not obsessed with just manipulation of women's bodies, but can actually revel in the humanity of other of women's bodies and so forth. And the same is true in terms of their attempts to fetishize celebrity culture and fetishize materialism and fetishized commodities as if, as if somehow all they need in life is big money and status. And there's a wonderful line in Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods. Stephen Sondheim is one of the great geniuses still alive, where he says, wishes that may come true but never free. And what he was saying was, you can have all the things you think you wish, but there's still a cost to be paid, a major cost to be paid. 
So we've got to spend time with our young folk, provide moral venues for their spirits. So they learn, in fact, to channel their energy in ways that are empowering and that are tied to struggles for truth and justice and freedom. And then let them know that so often what they have been dreaming of all these years of living large has its severe limitations and can be spiritually empty. They better learn how to love somebody. They better learn how to be tender to somebody. They better learn how to receive love and receive tenderness. They got to focus on the things that matter. But they are not by themselves. They are a sign and symptom of the larger culture. Because the same thing's happening on Wall Street. The same thing's happening in, in Washington, D.C., in the White House, in the Pentagon. The same thing's happening in universities. The same thing's happening in leadership roles, in churches, in mosques, in synagogues. They also are rendered captive to the superficial things. It's not just the young black folk who are to be isolated, and their behavior some, somehow viewed as so different from everybody else's. They act based on what they see in the culture. And they see the folks who win narrowly are often the folks who actually have power, guns, the ability to dominate in conquest. They're told in their history books, Alexander the what? So why is Alexander great? Because he, he conquered. That makes Jesus a chump. Because he dies on a cross for the conquerors who put him on a cross. Now what is your definition of greatness? Alexander the great, Jesus the great. But I'm being Christian, so I don't want to exclude nobody in this regard. But we're talking about conceptions of greatness. Martin Luther King Jr. died. He didn't have money for the life insurance for his family. Malcolm X had $151 in his whole bank account. Who was the richest man, the richest black man in New York in February 1965? Nobody knows or gives a damn. But nobody will forget about Malcolm concerned about freedom. How many Grammys did Curtis Mayfield win? Zero. How many Millie Vanilli win? Two. And tell me about greatness. How many Grammy Slash Stone win? Zero. Who cares? Greatness doesn't come in the form of recognition by a mainstream. I'm sorry to go on. All right, Brother West. Can you speak to the question of Libya and the killing of Gaddafi uh, during the Obama administration? Is there a specific perspective of progressives on that issue? Well, that was one of the examples I used in terms of uh, the U.S. empire, in terms of imperial foreign policy, in terms of the willingness to engage in not just the killing of Brother Gaddafi, massive killings in Libya. Now, I've got my disagreements with Gaddafi, but he, is, he was the head of a nation state. You don't go into nation states and kill the nation state and act as somehow you are promoting freedom. And the very notion that you have the arrogance to think that you can intervene in that way without any accountability or answerability is a sign that you think you're the policeman of the world, you see. And there should have been many of us raised our voices, but it was difficult to be critical of Brother Obama in those days. Now, in retrospect now, people say, oh, Lord, man, I didn't know all of that was happening. Good God Almighty, they killing all those folk like that? Well, we've got to be truthful, no matter what color the president is, no matter what gender the president is, no matter what sexual orientation the president is, you see. This is true on the local level. It's true on the regional level. It's true on the national level. It's true in the United Nations in that regard, you see. And what has been the result in Libya? Unimaginable social misery and political chaos. And where is the United States now? Wash his hands and gone. Wash his hands and gone. And that's just one example of that. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. What do you think about reparations for African Americans? Oh, yeah, there's no, there's, let's just be clear about what reparations actually consist of. 
Reparations is based on truth and justice. First, we got to find out what was the truth of not just how black people were treated, but the contribution that black people made in the shaping of the American economy, the shaping of American wealth. Let's just understand what percentage of black folk as chattel slavery, but still dignified Africans actually was. Let's tell a story about that. That's why we need a full-fledged discussion about slavery in the United States as the economic foundation of the whole nation. That's the truthful part. Then when we find out what the truth is and the damage, the question becomes like tort law in the law school, what is the repair? How does the repair connect to the damage done? How does the repair connect to the truth? And we have a full-fledged discussion about that. So anytime you talk about reparations, you got to get beneath the category and say, I'm concerned about truth and justice. This is not just a rhetorical deployment of a term that divides people. And then, of course, you have to go on. Why was it that the slaveholders in various parts of the country received reparations, but the slaves never did? There's something deeply sick about that when you think about it on a moral and spiritual calculus. But, of course, it's because property was held as sacred, and black folk were property. So when property is taken away from you, you receive reparations. So what you're saying is, oh, so property is more precious than human beings? Your profit is more precious than these folk made in the image of a god? Just be honest and candid about your twisted moral logic and your empty spiritual formulation, you see. That's the beginnings of a discussion of reparations. I'm glad to see that the, the, the discussion is, 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 is escalating, and I thank uh, my dear sister Yvette Cornell and brother Antonio, uh, Antonio uh, Moore and uh, brother Coates and others who are bringing these issues to bear, you see. But we need a candid conversation, and then in the end, we need some compensation. All right, Dr. West, this is, this is why they say uh, you get into teaching if you can just touch one. So this looks like this was written by a student. How does a person of color decolonize their mind? Ooh, wee. <laughs> Shoot, I could have my president come up and lay, lay out his analysis. So his writings represent some of the most powerful insights in this regard. The first thing is just by raising the questions means that you're coming out of the block strong. Just by raising the question. See, part of the problem of education is you got to raise the right kind of questions that generate the kind of critical reflection in order to even find a glimpse of the answer. And in raising the question, the answer is not push button. It's not as if here it is, here's the formula, here's the dogma, here's the algorithm. No, it's part of a broader conversation. So you read some Audre Lorde, and you read some C.L.R. James, and you read some Du Bois, you read some Garvey, you read some Bell Hooks, you read a whole host of folk who've been wrestling, you read in Googies, Decolonizing the Mind, all of these folk who have raised this issue generation after generation after generation, which means you end up spending a whole lot of time in this wonderful library we were in with the archives, the magnificent archives. They've got some serious voices in there. One of the points that I didn't make in terms of lifting every voice, you can't lift your voice without breaking bread with the voices of the dead. Much of the wisdom and the history of the world was put forward by folks whose bodies are culinary delighted terrestrial worms. They're not here now. So you got to read what they said. You got to wrestle with what they said. And a lot of that's true in your own families of wise brothers and sisters in your own families who are gone now, but whose voices continue to, to filter through your own voice. Part of their afterlife is at work in your life because they taught you something that had something to do with your dignity and your integrity, that decolonizing that can take place. Never lose those voices. That's why Monk told Train, he said, you know, you've been imitating Johnny Hodges of the Duke Ellington band too long, Train. Come to my house. I got a couch. I got a piano. I'm going to teach you something. But Monk, that sounds wrong. Monk said, sometimes wrong is right. When you're breaking the rules because you know the rules so well, you're going to get something like the genius of Theolonius Monk. 
But there's no monk without Smith. There's no monk without those earlier piano players who taught him so much. And there's no John Coltrane without Johnny Hodges and Charlie Parker. And a whole host of earlier voices that then led to his voice. And he is now producing new ones like L.A.'s Kamari Washington and some of the others. When that clock gets to zero, we're going to stop. Oh, no, that's right. No, we're going to get started. All right. So this appears to be from another student. Servant leadership is my value as a student. How do I hold on to this truth when speaking for students' rights in a room full of those in power and value capitalism and graduation rates? Oh, no, that's wonderful. That's, no, that's wonderful. No, the first thing you want to do, of course, is again, always check yourself because, of course, there's no dogmatic conception of truth that you have. You've got to be open to learning what the quest for truth is about. But in that quest for truth, you still want to take a stand. You want to be honest. You want to be candid. With those in power, you lay bare your arguments. You lay out your evidence. You tell them, this is why I what I believe in light of the vision and analysis that I have. And you bring power and pressure to bear in the form of persuasion. You bring power and pressure to bear in the form of various attempts to convince whoever is in power that you have not just a point, but you got a heart that is concerned about making this place better. And you appeal to what you have in common with those in power, which is to do what? To make California State University Dominguez Hills the most visionary, courageous, Socratic, prophetic institution of higher learning. And you can do it together as you wrestle with these issues, not just students and administration, but faculty, not just faculty, staff, not just staff. Even the community can play an important role because this is an institution that embraces the connection between town and gown, between community and academy. So you keep that process going. And I say that, of course, on behalf of myself because I, uh, you know, I, I, I got in a lot of trouble when I was in college, but that's just footnote. All right, we're going to follow that one up with how can youth become impactful towards higher movements other than self with so many distractions and with social media lies and corruption? Oh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Well, keep in, li keep in mind, though, that lies and corruption are not new for any generation, any historical moment. Much of the history of the species it's not just domination, oppression, and exploitation, but it's lies and corruption. So don't think this is some new. What's new are the technological instrumentalities that facilitate the communication of lies and corruption and the need for accountability. So the first thing you want to do is first exemplify in your own life a countervailing example to corruption and the lies. And do it in such a way that you recognize you are not pure in terms of your freedom from corruption. What separates you is that you're willing to wrestle with the corruption that lies inside of you in a much more candid and honest way. So there's no self-righteousness in this process at all. There's no purity in this process. There's a lot of... Uh, white brothers and sisters come up to me and they said, oh, Brother West, you know, I've transcended racism. My grandparents have a lot of work to do, but not me. I don't have a racist bone in my body. And I say, really? I said, I've been a black man in America 66 years, and there's still some white supremacy inside of me. So if there's some white supremacy inside of me, my hunch is you got a lot of work to do. So it's not a question of your pureness. It's a question of the quality of your effort against it. I got male supremacy inside of me. I got to conquer it every day. I got American imperial identity inside of me. I got to conquer it. I got homophobia, transphobia. There's no Christian civilization not shot through with anti-Jewish hatred. I got to conquer it every day. Anti-Muslim hatred. I got to conquer it every day. Day. That's why I can't do it alone. That's why I got partners like Brother Thomas Parham and the others. Keep me accountable. And that's what we need in communities, keeping each other accountable, honestly, candidly, tenderly, gently, 
because no one of us emerged unscathed in a civilization of 400 years of white supremacy. I don't care what color you are. You can show up from Mars and come to Los Angeles in three days. You'll be asking questions. <laughs> what kind of society is this? Here's Jim Crow Jr. Look at all of these black folk over here, all these black poor people over here, all the white folk over here, white poor, white middle class. Why, how come they divide themselves these days? Sit down, come to California State University, Dominguez Hills, and learn something. We're going to teach you something about the shaping of this nation, but you can still be a force for good, but you're going to be scathed by some of these evils. And that's true in any society. Look at our Dalit brothers and sisters in India. What's happening right now in Kashmir, Tibet, Iran, beloved Iran, my dear sister, and Ahita. All of these various contexts were forms of hatred, institutional oppression, operating, repression, operating. Same message. Straighten up. Tell the truth. Tokyo, Seoul, Beijing, cross the board. It's a human message. I promised you when that clock got to zero, we wasn't going to ask any more questions. So we, go? we still got 20. Oh, zero now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was 21 seconds. I'd like to call our president, uh, Dr. Thomas Parham, back up. <laughs> We'd like to thank Dr. West for being so generous with his time and for appearing. This brother gets an incredible number of invitations, and without hesitation, he accepted our invitation. And so we know that you have probably a whole mansion full of plaques, but we hope that you will put ours someplace close and significant. So I'd like to ask our, our president to help me in presenting this uh, little momentum signifying the day that you were our distinguished speaker for the Diamond Lee Institute and the California State University at Dominguez Hills. And I should say a word about the greatness of Merv Domley. Give it up for Domley right now. Give it up for our dear brother. Give it up for our dear brother. As I present this, I want to invite a couple people up with us for this picture. Uh, Christian Jackson, our student body president, come forward if you oh, would. Yes. Charles Thomas, our chair of the Academic Senate, come forward if you would. Mr. Provost, come forward if you would. Michael Spagnum. Kim Costino, chair of our undergraduate education, please come forward. Your deanship, please. And this is a small part of the administration that manages this campus, but Brother West, I want you to know, on this plaque is an image of Merv Diamond. Oh, yes. But I need you to know something today. Mm. Yeah. Somewhere I read that existence has a face on every side, huh. and every face teaches a lesson. And those of us that truly understand existence never separate the faces from the lessons they teach us, mm. say the knowledge holders. Mm. Mm. So as you display this diamond -y plaque in whatever point of right, space and time you can put it, know that it is Merv Diamond's image that is on here, but his face teaches some profound lessons about risk-taking about struggle, about connecting to, right, what society calls the least of these, about mm. being involved with the struggle of ordinary, everyday people in the same way that you are. And so this plaque represents not only the Merv Diamond Institute, but the best traditions that you have represented in your life. There's a parallel process here. When all is said and done, ladies and gentlemen, you should always be able to say that I have done what the people love and what the Creator praised. Dr. West, you have done throughout your life with uncompromising clarity, having flinched, your knees haven't buckled, you haven't studied not one bit. Mm. 
and you have done always what the people love and God praised. And we thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of your campus, this is for Dr. Cornell West. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Cornell West, give it up. Oh, I can hear you better than that. Give it up.